there's there's like a there's a school of thought of writing techniques that are acceptable and the lack of the oxford comma is acceptable however um and and like all rules like that as long as you're consistent what you're doing is probably fine but there's also sort of like a higher order of things where you can do things better than other people and the oxford (laughs) comma is one of them Hey, this is Writer's Row. I'm DC Wrighthammer. And I'm David Gain. And we have two guests today, DC. That's right. Who well, are they? We'll let them George introduce George ourselves. George? We'll start with We'll start with one of them, whoever talks first. Go ahead, Meg. <laughs> My name is Meg Trast. I am an author, I'm an editor and writing coach. And I wrote Write That Book You Keep Talking About How to Stop Planning and Start Drafting. Is that it in the background? This, this is it right here. And nice. it's available on Amazon yes. to help you get for, started. For people on podcast, there's a book behind her shoulder. And if you go to our YouTube channel, you will see the link to it. Yeah. <laughs> Who's the other person we've got, DC? Or person who is quiet so far? Um. I am uh, C.D. Tavner. I am the author, a science fiction and fantasy author, but I'm here to talk about editing because I'm also a freelance editor with Two Doctors Media Collaborative. And on that note, um, we will get into the topic, but if you like the content we've been putting out, make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel, subscribe to the podcast if you haven't done that already, Um, like this video, and give us some comments down below on the YouTube channel. Those are very helpful, and um, we'll try to get back to you, and uh, we'll go from there. So, uh, CD kind of led into what this show is about, but we wanted to take an episode and really talk about what are the major editing mistakes that we see from typically indie authors. Um, Those are the people that Meg and CD will come in into. Uh, contact with they will get their manuscripts and they will put them through the paces and so we want to talk about some of the things that they see very often we want to talk about some of the things they have to correct very often and um, we just want to have a very informative episode about that so I'm going to start with Meg and I'm going to have an open-ended question basically saying you get a fresh manuscript typically probably just from an indie author what are some of the things you already in your mind are thinking, or let's start with one, what's like the number one thing you're like, I'm probably going to have to correct this. Um, and so can you give some insight into that? Well, th- for correcting things that I would frequently see, a lot of it is going to be like one awkward phrase that the author uses, like something that they say over and over, or a word that they lean on. Um, I would say, like, I would point out, first of all, that CD and I have actually both worked on each other's books. I edited for him and he edited for me. The thing that CD found in my book was the word that. Like, I don't know how many times, but by the time I was done going through his edits, I was sick of those little bubbles. That just stricken out over and over. So there's going to be something that an author utilizes <laughs> in such a fashion right. uh, like the word that. that yes yeah. so um, yeah it's all it's also considered a sticky word isn't it yeah mm-hmm. yeah i was yeah. yeah what i love about the word that is that there are definitely instances where it's totally useful and we it's should use terrifying. it absolutely but i've read sentences before where it'll literally be that is used three or four times in one sentence and you're like, <laughs> and you're like maybe one or zero times <laughs> makes using it as a noun verb adjective <laughs> that 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 did that thing um got that, that. it got it how about you uh cd um so i think if we're if we're approaching a copy edit um which i feel like is probably the most common type of edit if you're working with an indie author. Um, I've done content edits for people that are seeking traditional publishing as well. Um, But for a copy edit for an indie author, um, 
it's definitely going to be those phrases that are used over and over again that every author uses. Even an author who is an editor, as Meg has illustrated, has phrases that they use over and over again. When I go back through my own work, I notice the phrases that I'm using over and over and over again. And often they're the same phrases that other authors are using too. So that's why, like, if you start to know what your phrases are, then you can easily just control F them when you're mm -hmm. self-editing. And it'll, it's going to speed up the editing process, not only for yourself, but for if you work with an editor, for your editor as well, if you've already gotten rid of them. Right. So what CD is saying is if you're an indie author, you can go control F yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Help but yourself. No, because one of the things that a lot of people do is they have this rule. Strike out seemed from your manuscript. Don't use, don't use this right. word. Don't use that word. And Literally this and that. This and that, uh, very sort of thought to like was, that was. Well, I wouldn't say was. I wouldn't say was either. Mm -mm. I've, I've seen I a lot was of was. Fine. Um, there are you people can who reduce. had right. had is a big one because a lot of people don't know how to write well in past participle, right. um, and that's something that you kind of have to practice to get good at anyway. Or you can lean a little more on your editor for that. Um, but it's also important not to be such a stickler for the rules that you, you handicap your writing because a lot of people will strike out things and then they wind up phrasing things very strangely or awkwardly because they're trying to avoid using a hot word. And there's nothing wrong with those words. It's just that those are the commonly overused words like seemed and very and had and that. Right. So what's another thing that people should be aware of and i just want to mention dc you have us on a clock right uh yeah we want to try to get as much uh editing advice as we can in this episode so we kind of want to keep it moving um but if people have questions about any particular item leave a comment down below between david myself meg and cd we're going to get your response so um, reach out if you uh, have any particular comments about an editing, you know, any of the pieces of editing they talk about. Um, but yeah, so re repetitive phrases. What What's some other things that we should probably keep in mind when we think we have a finished manuscript? So first off, I want to say I think Meg and I would both agree right now we're trying to work ourselves out of a job by making sure everyone knows all the tricks to do when approaching their manuscript. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> You'll never be out of a job. You know that. <laughs> um, but so one thing that I've noticed is often um, if you can learn punctuation rules, it's going to help yourself a, a lot. lot. Uh, especially the uses of things like em dashes and semicolons. Now, it's a different thing entirely to know how dialogue goes. But like there, like one of the most common things that I fix is actually a combination of a dialogue and a punctuation error, mm -hmm. where people will still do a comma after dialogue, leading into not a said phrase, but like mm -hmm. an action or a description. So it'll be like or vice versa. Saying, yeah, person is saying a thing, and then it's comma quotation mark, and then description when it should be period quotation mark, and then the description. Oh. Learning how to do dialogue right. is one of the hardest things. I would say that's probably one of the top things that I fix in copy editing is di just punctuation and dialogue. I don't wow. know why it's... And what's funny is when I first started writing, um, I had no issues with it. And then I hit like a middle ground where I felt like I was a decent writer, but I had no idea how to punctuate dialogue. <laughs> um, so that was something that I had to personally work really hard on as well, was learning how to do that. Uh, the connection between M dashes and dialogue is really complicated too. Yes. I was going to say, you mentioned an M dash. What is an M dash? There you go. <laughs> it is what? not a hyphen or an N dash. And right. what do you use it for, though? Let's just say it quickly. <laughs> it's, that's what, a it's lot of people don't know what it is. The, the M dash has a lot of different uses. So, like, it can be used for, like, if you're writing dialogue, for instance, and someone speaking. And they don't finish the sentence because right. someone like interjected or an yeah. action interrupted. Yep. Then you can put an M dash and then a quotation mark. And then the next line is that thing that's interrupting. Um, so that's one example. Or you can use mm -hmm. it for... Ahead, Me well, Meg, you want to give an example? So uh, parenthetical statements. 
they can surround parenthetical statements in place of parentheses. Um, so if you have a thought that is complete, but you want to just interject a little a little idea or snippet in the middle there, you can use an M dash for that. Yeah. And I just want to throw this out there as well, since I see it all the time. Um, an M dash is used for an interruption and an ellipses is when a person trails off in their thought uh, when you're doing that in dialogue. Which is very uncommon in the real world. I see a lot of trailing off in in books when it should be an interruption or just sure. someone decided that they were done talking. You know what? Never mind. Right. It's not a trail off. It's an intentional halting of speech. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And also, so M dashes can also be used. And this is one of those really technical dialogue formatting ones where you have someone speaking and then you have, a, so it's word, quotation mark, M dash, interrupting action that is actually occurring while the dialogue is happening, M dash, quotation mark, and then the next word. Oftentimes the M dashes are inside the quotation mark, but in that instance, the M dash goes outside the quotation mark. If you're unsure, ask your editor. Yes, but, but knowing those types of formatting rules for M dashes is useful because then you can streamline your writing. Mm -hmm. or, or, yes. or avoid the whole situation together I just to that. make it simpler. <laughs> um, I have a question, and this is going to basically polarize our audience. Um, oh boy, Is so, the Oxford comma? Yes, the Oxford comma, thank you. You Use see it. it as an editor. What do you do with an Oxford comma if you see it as an editor? I put them, actually, if they're missing, I add them. I always add them. I usually don't even ask. I just do it. Thank you. <laughs> we are on the same page. Okay, for people who don't know, this was not scripted. Uh, this was, <laughs> that, this was a, uh, a barometer for me to find out, you know, how are these if editors really editing? <laughs> so um, there's, there's like a, there's a school of thought of, writing techniques that are acceptable and the lack of the oxford comma is acceptable right. however um and and like all rules like that as long as you're consistent what you're doing is probably fine but there's also sort of like a higher order of things where you can do things better than other people and the oxford <laughs> comma is one of them <laughs> oh, I, I think it's really just always err on the side of making sure what you're trying to communicate is clearly Clear. communicated and the oxford comma is never going to hurt you exactly it right. may not matter but it could only help you mm -hmm. so here's here's the thing here's what i say about the oxford comma because some people will say it's needed some people will say it's not needed and some people will try to play um contrarian and say you're both wrong sometimes it's needed and sometimes it's not i will say unless the last two items in your list are related like they are literally related. Like you're making a list of three Wrong. things and the last two things are the same or similar and you want to group them, you mm -hmm. should always use the Oxford comma. Because otherwise me as a reader, and I'm really weird about this, I will group the last two things if you don't put that comma in there. To me, Your brain just, automatically does I that. Do it just, oh. it mm -hmm. just does it. And so that's, that's the distinction I want to make for people. I'm not an editor, but I am an Oxford comma advocate and I think you should use it too. I like to use the example, I invited the stripper Stalin and Hitler. Um, without the Oxford comma, Stalin and Hitler become the strippers in this well, that's, hypothetical that's, scenario. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't watch well, that. <laughs> with, the hypo with the Oxford comma, it becomes the strippers, comma, Stalin, comma, and Hitler, three separate right. entities, instead of describing the first thing on your list. Sure. So the Oxford comma helps clarify that you are in fact citing a list and not describing the first thing that you said. Okay. So I think that this whole topic of the Oxford comma gets to a really good point and something that I see a lot when editing is that often the phrasing of sentences, the way that someone will have written a sentence, and I think passive voice can play into this a lot, can create some really wonky, awkward sounding sentences that aren't clear. And so, like, one of the things I do a lot with editing is, like, just... And sometimes I won't even do this in the line. I might throw it off to a comment and just be like, hey, here's an alternative way that you could rewrite this sentence. 
and see how it sounds. And you as author, make the choice as to whether or not you want to use this alternative um, as opposed to what you have on the page because it just sounds so much more clear. Than, yeah, I um, agree. What you have. And I think Oxford comma is a good example of that sort of thing where it's like adding one word or deleting two words or putting this word at the beginning of this phrase is just helpful and it doesn't actually hurt what you're trying to say. It's the same content. Okay. Let's let's get another what is another problematic uh editing mistake that you see all the time um we covered a lot of the like copy uh, editing stuff I, yes. I can tell you one thing my editor corrected in my first novel i would put a phrase um uh opening the door he went into the room like so you try to do mm. these like two different action like, you try to put an action clause in front of another action clause. Mm -hmm. And at one point, I did something like, he was holding the milk, and he was holding the gun, and he opened the door. Like, I, I <laughs> way too many actions, and it became impossible for the character to do the things <laughs> I was trying to have them do. And my editor's like, hey, you need to calm down a little bit with those action clauses in the beginning, because... It allows you to cheat a little bit, right? It allows you to set the stage and say, hey, they're doing this one thing, and then they're also doing this other thing. Um, you just need to be careful with that because they should one should lead into the other, and one should be sort of like necessitated by the other, and you shouldn't do that too often because it mm -hmm. becomes like Tiring. very much, very action-oriented, and it begins... Mm -hmm it gets exhaustive for the reader to, to read all these different action clauses back and forth. One of the things that I see a lot is said and. So-and-so said and action beat. Um, when you can very easily remove the said and and just have the action beat following the dialogue. Or a lot of times it'll be like, so-and-so said and... And then they perform an action that really should have followed the dialogue and not gone along in sync with it. But what you do by saying said and is you make it seem like they're concurrent, like you're you're saying something and performing this action at the same time. Yeah. I uh, I said hello and took a drink of my water. So it sounds like you're trying to be a ventriloquist. You're taking right. a drink while you're speaking. And it should be you, I greeted them and then took a drink of my water. And there's nothing wrong with and then either. That bothers me that people say that. Can, Don't use uh, it too much, but it has a home. Yeah. I, then is there, another one of those words that could be used sometimes. But not sorry, always. David. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no, no. It's okay. We were trying to do too much, right? We were trying to set ants. Yeah. Uh, I do. I've noticed a lot because um, I'm doing a lot of editing lately as well. And the thing that I keep trying to tell people and myself, because I catch myself doing it as well, is um, overstuffing my sentences um, mm. with too many ideas almost. And I, I it kind of ties into what DC s started with as well, right? You, you kind of were like, let's just throw it all in there, where it's like, okay, what is the one idea that you're trying to project with this sentence? Like, what is the action? What is the intention? Whatever it is. And if you find that, cut it out and then follow it with the other pieces, you can build a really nice thing. Um, and uh, on top of this, it's um, I'm becoming very aware of sticky words, which are the top 100 words that are used in the English language. And we use them to kind of stick our sentences together. Mm -hmm. And that is a where we get a lot of overstuffing as well. So. Right. Becoming aware of those two ideas, I think, is really important. And I, one thing that kind of comes up when I'm talking to people is they think that by having more comple complex sentences, they're, they're sounding more intelligent or sophisticated in their writing. And it's like, yeah, no, you're just making it messier and more confusing, I find. The best, the best thing I ever saw was like a graph that showed... Um, how advanced your writing is by how well you're able, like how complicated your explanation of the idea is. 
So it's very common for a simple idea to be explained with simple words. It's poor writing for a simple idea to be explained with complicated words. It's great writing for something complex to be explained with simple words. So if you can present your ideas in a way that everyone can understand and absorb really quickly and really thoughtlessly, that is what makes your writing great. Yes. One I, of the many things. Yeah. So And you can avoid sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, you're good. Go for it. You have um, continue there. So you can avoid that issue that you're having too, David, if you take a moment and consider what you're showing rather than what you are telling. Oh, we don't oh, yeah. this. Uh, there it is. <laughs> Because <laughs> I, I was about to say something that's very related to the showing versus <laughs> conversation. So I want to illustrate something that I've noticed a lot. And I think there's in, it, like all of these rules, quote unquote, there's always instances where you should maybe use these words. But a sentence that says she saw the vase fall on the ground mm -hmm. or just the vase fell on the ground and yes. All the senses, like she thought, all those things, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There could be instances where you need to make clear that your character, the point of view character, is the one doing the sensing because of whatever may have been going on in the scene where you need to make sure the reader is pivoted back to the point of view character. But, like, in general, there is, I'm not going to name the book because um, it's a very um, high profile book at the moment, but I was, re I was actually listening on audiobook to a novel recently. And I cannot kid you enough how frequently those phrases were used. It was like every four sentences, it was like yeah. she saw, he heard, they thought, like whatever, like every sentence. And it was just like, like, this, it was like a chalkboard. I yeah. totally feel like it's in my TBR list right now. <laughs> <laughs> You can use I'll tell you guys later. <laughs> you can use that that POV sort of um, he saw, she heard to describe something that's happening outside of the normal purview. Like I, I'm not looking in that direction, but I I, I hear something. I hear a clatter. So yeah. I turn to look and see the vase fell. So that's when she yeah. heard and she saw are relevant because you're letting your reader know in what order those things happen. I didn't catch the vase because I didn't see it falling, but I see that it fell. Yes. But you could also just say, like mention there's a vase on the floor. Sort right, of yeah, the, the, there's pieces, pieces of clay on the there's floor. There's pieces and... What used to, to be her grandmother's antique china vase, now oh, they... I thought grandma <laughs> was in the vase. <laughs> That's an urn. That was my oh, no, but I, I was expecting Meg to twist it here. <laughs> I am not uh, a famous movie director. <laughs> I think it gets to the whole show v tell idea, though, because like if you're saying like he saw or she heard, that's 100%. You're, you're just telling the reader that happened. Like, as opposed to showing them the sensory experience that your character is experiencing, which is the sound of the vase falling or the like the emotions they're feeling as they see their grandmother's 300 year old vase falling off the shelf like grandmother's that, like, ashes scattered <laughs> on the floor right. exactly uh, like that like if you, that's what you should be writing, not the she saw a vase fall mm -hmm. like. That's how you get, first of all, choppy writing, and second of all, very emotionless, why do I care about this writing? Yes. The, well, what, oh, well, sorry, one, what, one thing that I was going to say is, for a first draft, these sentences and these mistakes are yes. totally acceptable, by the way. Yes. So, oh, like, anybody who's this far into this episode, and they're like, oh, man, I have to really watch my writing, on a first <laughs> draft, on a second draft, no, the just get the story out. Just put it on paper. That's actually the, something. Go ahead. But by the no, time was... you are going to query or by the time you are going to send it to an editor, you should start to work some of these things out. So I wanted to just kind of make that clear, you know, at this point that um, write it and make mistakes. Like actually like own those mistakes. Like know that you are writing bad. Like... Um, I think the phrase shitty first draft is actually a thing for a reason because you should do it. 
Um, mm-hmm. You should embrace it, and you should get through that first draft as quickly as you can, because then you can go back, and some of these editing um, ideas that we're talking about here, you can start to implement, you can start to, to, to do. Um, it's not to uh, dissuade anybody from writing. It's not to make you feel bad if you're making these mistakes. It's literally just to improve your writing and give you a better chance to succeed when you actually go to do the publishing step. So I'm just making that clarification at this point in the, in, in the episode. Uh, but feel free to, let's, let's keep going with it. Let's get a couple more editing uh, ideas uh, for people so we can help them out. Can I was I... actually going to, oh. go ahead. Nope, mate, go. I was going to point out that's actually one of the biggest mistakes people make is editing as they write their first draft. And trying to write something that is perfect (laughs) (laughs) their first go-round. Now, you will get better at writing better first drafts as you write and write and write. Your brain is a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it'll get. But you have to give yourself permission to write something imperfect your first time around, or you will never finish your book. I no write one. everything perfect right off the bat. So. I bet you do. No bet one will ever see the first three drafts of my novel. That <laughs> oh, yeah. I have Twelve published. drafts They are me. so <laughs> bad. Like, yes. uh, I think there's... I think a, a mistake that some people might make is actually potentially going to an editor too soon. Yeah. They just sh- scaring away people from working with <laughs> Um, is that like no, but no, you should self edit first? Yeah, you should self edit. Also, get beta readers, critique mm-hmm. partners, whatever you need for your process for writing. Because I know back when I was uh, first, I'd done like two drafts of my novel, and I was like, oh, I'm ready for an editor now. Mm-hmm. No, and I <laughs> wasted money on an editor. I think I have a blog post about this somewhere. Um, where I wasted money on an editor, not in the sense that like wasted because the editor gave me fantastic feedback and really pointed out all the problems with my book that I probably should have been able to recognize myself. Um, if I actually done my due diligence and knowing how, what the process should be like, so like make sure that you've gone through the steps, done two or three drafts, had other people look at it before you even think about an editor, especially if it's your first book, if you've written a few books, then the process is entirely different at that point. Yeah. Well, I have one author I work with who does his first draft, a self-edit, and then sends it to me. And by the time it gets to me, there's maybe one or two issues, and I have to fix the punctuation because he doesn't know how to punctuate anything. Um, and he doesn't <laughs> try. He's like, CD, Meg's but... going to take it, uh, so I don't have to worry about that stuff. He'll call me like, you're going to have to fix all this stuff I know already. <laughs> right. But yeah, there's... CD's right. Um, the the more that you do yourself, the better, the the more value you're going to get out of your editor. Your editing will also be cheaper. I'm yeah. gonna say that too. <laughs> right. Like you're putting a lot of money into your editor sometimes if you're doing you're sending stuff that should have been fixed. Mm-hmm. Can mm-hmm. I can I I think one of the things you're kind of suggesting, but I, I some people rush to get it to the editor and that patience of just like sit on your writing for a bit, mm-hmm. take some distance away from it and then come back. I, I will always quote it because I always love it is Stephen King, stick it in a drawer and pull it out only when it looks like an alien object. Right. Yeah. And then you're, you're going through it and you're like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I haven't, I never realized all these things are going on. So having that distance is a fantastic Fantastic. Not only for editing, but also for you liking your own writing. Because a lot of times you'll finish something and you've been over it so many times that you're sick of it and you hate it. Right. I know. <laughs> um, so if you if you give yourself a chance to put it away and not look at it for a while. I actually recently did that with a book I finished about two years ago. And I hated it so much. I was like, this is going in the garbage And I I pulled it out last month to just sort of see where I was at with it and realized it was not as ugly as I thought it was. So giving yourself that distance, allowing yourself to become more fond of what you've written is really important, too. One of the... Oh, sorry. I kind of wanted to shift gears because I think we we spent a lot of time on um, punctuation and grammar and things like that. But what are some content and some story edits... What are some things that you see there that 
you you have to really give suggestions back to the author to think about. What are some of those things you've seen, Meg? I've seen people both assuming that their audience is dumber than they are and people assuming that their audience is smarter than they are. Or maybe not smarter in so much as able to infer much more. Um, there's a lot of times, like, and I know we talked about this at length previously. Um, I don't think we did it on the show, but we talked about Game of Thrones and um, some issues <laughs> oh with the writing there. Where they changed, <laughs> well, they changed the ending because someone on a fan forum figured out the ending. Um, and they're like, well, we have to be unpredictable and we have to surprise them. You don't have to surprise your audience. You just have to entertain them. And right. if they can see your ending coming because you've set up a good ending, that is not a bad thing. We don't all have to be M. Night Shyamalan. You can write a book that takes you from A to B logically and still have a good story. And trying too hard to make a twist that is unpredictable will land you with a really like weird and hard to follow book. I think uh, that's I think that's spot on when it comes to like thinking about the overall trajectory of your story. I've I've recently <laughs> used this quote with uh, someone I've been helping out um, where he writes so close to the bone that he left no meat for the audience to <laughs> Like mm, a linear writer. What the hell is going on? So yeah, sure. So well, and I, I would say that my writing is actually on the other end of the spectrum to some extent. Um, and my my editor has actually said that, hey, you're a bit subtle here. <laughs> like, um, you do realize that your readers are going to work. They are taking care of their family. They are going out with their friends. And in between all of that, they're getting in maybe five or six pages. And so she's like, hey, here, you think they're going to remember this one thing that happened three chapters ago with detail? Yes. Um, and... When they read it six months ago and don't even right. remember who the main characters are? Exactly. And I also alternate point of views. And there, and she was like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're going to need to spell this out a little bit. <laughs> um, and so I guess one of the things that I've learned as an author is that being deliberate and being obvious is not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. You do have to do it in a stylistic way. You have to do it in a way that fits the story. But um expecting like readers especially casual readers to get that reference that obscure reference from book one where you talked about coffee they're not going to get that reference in book two necessarily yes some of your diehard readers might get it but 99 percent of them are not and so don't be surprised if you get lower score you know lower reviews for that or things like that it you know you really have to kind of play your cards right in order to make some of those references or some of those subtleties actually work for you mm -hmm. unless you make those subtleties like easter eggs essentially <laughs> that's I, actually I, um i stephen bruce talked about that at narrativity which was write a story that has layers so right your top layer should be your casual readers everyone who reads the book gets your story they get all the big basic plot elements and that's easy for everyone to read and digest put a layer under that everyone who reads the book once or twice or maybe three or four times oh i didn't notice that the first time that totally gives away something that happens later and put another layer under that that guy had coffee in book one and now this thing is happening because of that <laughs> For, yep. your, for your diehard fans. So put something in there for everyone. You know, obviously don't make the main story suffer for the Easter eggs. Right. But you can have those things without taking away from the easy, linear, simple to follow plot. Yep. Uh, one yeah. of the... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, nope, go ahead, David. I was going to say just a good example of that. I, th maybe this is dating me, but I remember when The Matrix came out the originally. Mm -hmm. Everyone kind of enjoyed the overall story. And then there was that group of people just in, embraced all the little Easter eggs that they left in there and right. got really excited about it. And mm -hmm. I think raised it a bit higher than it. <laughs> it wasn't as well, deep as they were going for, but they really celebrated it. So that was good. 
Mm-hmm. Well, and like I think chapter titles is a good example of that. Like chapter titles, yeah. like ninety nine percent of readers aren't going to get them. Your rereaders are definitely going to get them because they they kind of anticipate where you're going. And then you do have your sort of sharper readers. Otherwise, you know, I, I use chapter titles because they're for me, actually. They're not for the reader, and I'll admit that on the air here, um, because they're fun for me. They're double entendre. Sometimes mm-hmm. they allude to what's going to happen in the chapter in a very indirect way. Um, but understand that if you are looking for a tighter, sharper novel, that those are things that can go um, that you can cut those things out in the last phases of editing if you're looking for, you know, if you're just trying to make it a, a, a cleaner, you know, story. Um, those are some things that can go in the editing phase. So I just kind of wanted to mention that there. Yeah, I think that's really, yeah. really good to bring up. I never use chapter titles. I just do right. chapter one or actually one of project I have releasing is just Roman numerals. Um, nice. And... <laughs> But I, I, that's actually one of the things. As when Sorry, I, I really like Roman numerals. That was a little too enthusiastic. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> when I edit, sure. I almost never touch authors' chapter titles because mm-hmm. I'm just like, that's your thing. Skip chapter it. Titles Skip. like, like that's like, and usually they're unless it's like they wrote like a novel as a chapter title. <laughs> then I would probably be like, you should probably not do that. Um. So one of the things that I always think about in content editing, especially when someone's providing a book that is particularly lengthy and if they're trying to and most of my content edits have been people who are trying to do traditional publishing so they're thinking Mm -hmm. about i'm trying to pitch this to a korean agent and everyone knows there's like those sweet spots for word counts Mm -hmm. and thinking about like first off what scenes are truly necessary to your story because sometimes there are plot hooks that like are really cool and compelling, but you can sometimes pull them out. Kill um, your darlings. I, yeah. Um, and then um, I always, <laughs> oh, nice. I always think about how sometimes there's superfluous characters, mm. um, and right. sometimes where you could actually take a character who's minor, especially when books have a lack of a clear antagonist, and you can, or or sometimes there's someone who is the antagonist, but they don't show up until like halfway through the book <laughs> and you could actually take that antagonist and combine them with a character that you have in like the first act and then disappears halfway through the book and then mm-hmm. have like overarching conflict that is crossing your entire I always narrative. recommend giving small roles to char- to big characters if you have Susie the barista say something prophetic in chapter 1 don't give that to Susie the barista. Give it to your main <laughs> character's best friend. Yeah. Give it to your main character's boss or their 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 rival at work. Don't don't hold on to those things. And DC, kill your darlings is in reference to letting go of things that you love but don't serve the story. Yep. I think we talked about it before, but I don't remember. Well, no, thank, I, thanks for clarifying that to me. Thank you. <laughs> thank you no, for sometimes. that. Well, because you went. <laughs> no, 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 I, I got it. I wanted to, to, to define it, but yeah, well, go ahead. Like everything, though, there is sometimes a moment where, like, don't follow that kill your darlings rule to the letter because there may be a moment in your story that it isn't clearly serving the story, but if it's like a profound character moment and it's but like. That is serving your story. Right. If it's but, like, contributing to character development. Saying. When you're working on your book, though, you may be at first, when you're, like, zoomed right. in on this scene and not taking a step back, you might be like, this isn't serving the plot, so therefore I'm... <laughs> <laughs> right. That's why you don't edit when you're writing the first yep. draft. Yes. <laughs> or the second draft. I would say don't take out those pivotal scenes until you absolutely have to shave off the last of your words. And right. if a scene evokes something, keep it. Yeah. If it makes you feel something, that's sort of the whole point of reading a book is to feel something different than our, you know, everyday what we do and what we see and what we experience. So if if a scene is highly emotional or highly moving for whatever reason, keep it. That's part of your story. That's part of your journey. Well, and one of the things that um that I've learned as an author is that yes, darlings come out. So for for everyone a, a darling is, 
a side story or a lot of detail into something that doesn't build to the overarching story that you're trying to tell. Um, and a lot of times people say, kill your darlings, get rid of them if they don't actually contribute to the, the main story. Um, I find that I actually end up writing some of those and my editor will call me on them. And then <laughs> my challenge as an author is to actually make them relevant to the story <laughs> itself um, instead of killing them, which is probably bad. But I've actually Not necessarily. Been to, I've been able to keep several darlings alive. Uh, <laughs> by actually tying them back into the story and giving the story. So like the extreme, I think, is like from a movie perspective, Quentin Tarantino will take you on a bunch of rides in these side conversations that seem completely superfluous that could probably be cut. And somehow he makes them so impactful to the story that you're like, no, why would we ever cut that? Because that is very crucial to the feeling, the tone, and mm -hmm. the character development of the story. Um, the problem is, is when you go in and try to be Quentin Tarantino and you have a story of darlings, and then you yeah. kind of have a little bit of a problem. Um, but I think that having them and tying them together, I agree. You should very carefully consider them in the la latter drafts. Um, if they bring something to the story, consider keeping them. If you can cut them in the end, maybe you consider cutting them. If they bring anything to the story, and, and it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a moment of realization, and it doesn't have to be a turning point. It can just be something that makes you feel really good about whatever's going on or something that makes you feel really bad about whatever's going on. If it contributes to tone, if it helps solidify characters, if it helps set the scene, whatever it does, if as long as it does something and evokes something. And a lot of times authors will tell me they know, they already know what I'm going to tell them has to go. <laughs> so you're you're going to have kind of a gut feeling. And the more you write, the better you'll get at sort of detecting. And a lot of authors will still try to get it in there. And, oh, I really want to put this in there. And they right. know, they already know their editor is going to say, that doesn't work. That's not helping you. That's holding you back. So now, Meg, what do you think, and, and DC and David as well, about... <laughs> When it comes to providing content suggestions for things like setting and description, um, I think those are sometimes some of the hardest content edits to provide because it's unless an author is providing copious amounts of info dumping. That's I think everybody. You don't need to talk about info dumping. Everybody knows the info dumping rules. We that's, went into this before. <laughs> um, Yes, that's why. Like, unless talking. someone's providing copious amounts of info dumping, oftentimes it's very hard to get in the author's head and know what is the world they've built behind their story. Because if they're most authors that I've worked with so far have actually done a really good job of not throwing everything on the page. And so when thinking, trying to provide suggestions of like, hey, I'm not getting a feel for what your setting is, um, it's almost like you just have to say, hey, I'm not getting a feel for yeah. what setting is. I usually, I'll try to call, I, I try to talk to my authors on the phone as often as I can, um, especially if I'm having, if, if I'm having a situation like that where I've been given a scene and I don't understand it or I, I don't see what's supposed to be happening. And I usually just ask, what are you trying, what are you trying to do with this scene? Yeah. What is it that you're wanting me to take away from this? Um, you know, I, I know that you stand by this too, CD. Our job as author, as editors is to help the author realize their vision to, to its fullest potential. Yeah. And so being able to have that conversation and hear them describe it, not just see it written, but hear them talk about it and how they feel about it. And what's the, what's the tone in their voice and the emotion in their voice sort of as they're telling you about it really says a lot about what they want to do in the book. Whether they've been able to do that or not, once you sort of have that vision, you can help them find it. One thing I've noticed that I've done myself, and now I'm seeing it in other authors, is that what you think is on the page isn't actually on the page, mm, mm -hmm. especially in those in those location descriptions or whatever. Yeah. Um, in our second book, my editor came to me and was trying to understand 
the windows of a cabin and where they were placed and everything like that. I'm like, well, it makes sense. And she saw windows that were up high and I saw windows that were down low, but it wasn't on the page. So then it was unclear. And then on our third book, we have a lot of business in the last section of it where you're going to this this place. I'm trying to be as vague as possible. <laughs> um, you're going through this place. And I like I had a diagram written out I had blueprints of the place like it was I knew exactly what it was but for some reason it wasn't on the page but I I also couldn't understand why she couldn't understand what was there yep. and it was a lot of back and forth and a back and forth and I was like look at my diagram <laughs> <laughs> I've got it right here so, I swear yeah. Yeah. So, but I, that's, I think that's where like having an editor or having a second reader, someone who is not of your perspective, mm -hmm. looking at it and just saying, I don't understand this. Can you just describe it? And it could be like a sentence. It could be just, you know, a word for some people of just like that, that one thing that doesn't make sense. And and, and if yeah, you've gone it's... through your beta readers and your alpha readers and your your friends and family and you know the people who do your your preliminary reading, you will eliminate so much of that right off the bat. Because someone who's especially someone who's not super into writing, that's why I always recommend people find beta readers who aren't writers or who aren't editors, because they're gonna see it from the audience perspective, yeah. mm -hmm. and they're gonna say I didn't understand this I I here's what I pictured and that's all they know how to tell you they they don't have a suggestion for how to make it clearer but they can tell you what's missing yeah. and I think that's super important to have yeah. that that third perspective and I think we could go on with this all night and <laughs> we could fill up probably a dozen shows um for this episode I think we probably reached a saturation point but uh no. I do no, right. I thought this was a two-hour episode. Right, exactly. We're going to do nine-hour. Right. This is going to be a, a marathon writer's row episode. Uh, we will, especially if people like this episode, they give it a thumbs up. If they're listening to it on podcast, we will circle back and do another episode and not cover the same things because that would be silly. <laughs> Uh, we but no, totally. uh, at this point, I think I'm going to say, let's do some self promotion or promotion in general. And so I'm going to give an opportunity starting with Meg to promote whatever she would like to promote. Awesome. Well, I will say that, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Sorry. I was, I when... was going to point at your book. Well, my book, obviously, as you can see, what is <laughs> What? I said I edited it. Yeah, and, and CD <laughs> edited my book, and I actually have a copy over here that he signed for me um, nice. next to his name because we are in a college play. Um, <laughs> is this episode airing in November? Yes, it probably will. Okay. Well, it's I'm, November now, it's November right? So. right? It is now. November. It is. I, I didn't know if it was airing this month. Um, oh, okay. oh, that's fair. That's fair. So I am giving away one manuscript critique. Um, if you are following me on Twitter and you tweet at me the hashtag NanoRimo2019, um, I will select a winner on December 13th, and you can win a, a free critique of your NanoRimo manuscript. Um, and then also in January, I am going to be hosting a seminar here in Kansas City, a writing seminar. It is free. So you just have to show up and have a place to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and it's one day. It's just one day. And it's at the end cool. of January. You don't have dates yet. but Okay. Awesome. And that That's is all great. I have. Thank you. Thanks, Meg. What do you got, CD? Uh, first, I want to say that I think everyone should take a lesson from this and think about content editing the prequel trilogy of Star Wars. And then... <laughs> 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 yeah, we talked about this in the content. Um, and so that's your that's your homework. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> second, uh, I just this is totally for my author side, not for my editing. I can, uh, it, well, I can loop it back in. But um, I have a billion free promotional codes for uh, my uh, the audiobook of my um, first novel, first of their kind, because when you publish through ACX. You get a billion free promotional codes to give out. There's hey. the 
Um, so if anyone wants a free promotional code, literally just message me and I will give you one. Um, that being said, I have now gone through the process of working with a narrator for an audiobook. And if anyone wants to chat about what that's like, feel free to reach out to me via Twitter. And I will definitely talk to you about that process and uh, not charge you for it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and he's both a lawyer and an editor, so that means a lot. This is true. There you go. <laughs> but but you're not their lawyers, so... Correct. <laughs> Nothing I say to you unless we've signed a contract constitutes valid legal advice. There you go. There we go. <laughs> David, what do you got tonight? Um, I'm going to give two uh, recommendations. Uh, yeah, go to cunosingain.com, sign up for our newsletter, and you get uh, uh, stuff from us. <laughs> um, and then also... Uh, I'm going to give homework as well. <laughs> Editing other people's work uh, is the quickest way to start learning how to start seeing those kind of mistakes. Because the more you do it, the 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 more you gain that knowledge. So see that's the patterns. It. That's all I am And saying. before DC says anything, I want to piggyback on that comment and emphasize it because... Um, <laughs> If you are someone who is strapped for catch and you're an author, like if you get good at editing other people's work, then you could do an edit swap with someone. If like you're mm -hmm. really not someone who has the money because people are in different places with their finances, like like that is a thing you can do is find another author you're friends with and be like, hey, let's edit each other's work. Awesome. That is DC. a good point. What do I you got? Uh, we had a recent guest on Writer's Row, um, and for our YouTube fans, I'm going to ah. show off <laughs> her uh, coffee mug that she sent me, because if you're going to send me swag, I'm going to definitely, uh, you know, rep it on uh, the <laughs> YouTube channel. Uh, and it's an uh, awesome let's coffee just clarify, mug. clarify, I didn't get mine yet, because I never sent her my and, email or my... And, Address, it is so. from Marnie Young, Audio Sorceress. So if you are looking to get an audiobook made, um, she came on the show. I have not had her make my audiobook or anything like that, but it's somebody that came on the show and, and gave a, a very good explanation of the whole situation with audiobooks. So um, I will give her a plug for this show as well. We appreciate everybody watching. Thanks, Meg. Thanks, CD. We really appreciate you coming on, and we appreciate everybody watching until this long. Thanks. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Bye, guys. Absolutely. Great.